All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from beautiful Blue Sky, San Diego. And today I'm joined by Katrina Burros, who is in Las Vegas. I'm sure the skies are equally blue, if not bluer there. Yes, right? they are blue. Uh, excellent. And uh, 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 Christina has the MKB uh, coaching company, executive coaching company. And we're going to talk about something fascinating today, and that is Brilliant Jerks. Okay, so we all probably know Brilliant Jerks, and we probably worked with Brilliant Jerks. Maybe we work with them. Maybe we are Brilliant Jerks. Who knows? Um, but Christina has... Uh, Katrina, Katrina. 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 And Katrina has her own process for turning brilliant jerks into effective leaders. So let's let's start off with the baseline, Katrina. What is a brilliant jerk? How do we, what's the, what are the traits of a brilliant jerk as opposed to just a jerk? Well, let me explain the difference between a brilliant jerk and a demanding leader with high standards. Okay. Okay, you might think they're the same thing. But let's say if the brilliant jerk uh, has an employee that comes to him and says, look, you know, I wasn't able to do it. Uh, the brilliant jerk will probably uh, immediately be threatened by it, uh, his status or his leadership abilities, and have a very gut reaction to the person and will feel threatened. And therefore, often these brilliant jerks, when feeling threatened, they attack mm. in one way or the other. So they don't think they, that it has this gut reaction. Well, the demanding leader with the high standards, you know, in the same situation comes in with an employee that doesn't, uh, hasn't achieved the results desired, will step back, analyze. Now, is this person unable to do it? Is this person unwilling to do it? And then will adapt his leadership and his leadership agility to react according to the situation at hand. If he's an unable, he'll help the person, the employee to manage the project or, or divide the project or give them mentorship. If the person is unwilling, then it's a motivational issue and then we'll adapt his discussion with that person in a different way. So there's an example of the different reaction uh, at the same problem. Mm. And and the and the brilliant jerk when you say you know will react defensively and maybe attack. I presume it's not always overt. It's not always immediate, right? I mean, it can be passive aggressive too. It can be passive aggressive. Uh, the consequences are very important for the organization. I mean, on an individual level, uh, people won't come and talk to him because they are fear his reaction. And so he gets the pr issues at hand uh, very late and it's harder to resolve the issues. Uh, if the people are scared of how he's going to react, they, they, their behavior adapts to his mood rather than to what's best for the company, for example. So and then people will be less creative. Uh, they, uh, they'll say, wait and see. Uh, they're not empowered to, to do the best they can. That's uh, on the individual and the team level, there's less creativity as well. People won't stand up and give their ideas if they feel threatened that maybe they will be criticized for that. That's to give you an example. The mm -hmm. other thing on a team level, it will create more turnover, lit litigations. It could be people sue sure. the company. And if they sue, it affects the reputation. And if it affects the reputation of the company, it's higher. It's more expensive to hire people and more difficult. There's uh, health issues. There's absenteeism. There's presenteeism, which means that they're there, but they're not sure. really concentrated. I love that presenteeism. Um, and so why then do you call, why do, then do you call these brilliant jerks? I mean, where, where's the brilliant part? The brilliant is because they're very useful for the company. Usually if they're okay. not at all useful, they're, they're let go. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're brilliant because they might have an incredible expertise. Uh, they might get in outstanding results. Uh, they might be like in a hospital, uh, a heart surgeon that they research to get uh, at that, and finally, through, 
years afterwards, he comes to the hospital, but has terrible med bedside manners. Uh, and no nurse wants to work with him. So it's, it's, uh, they bring something to the organization. But at one point, it's the seeds of the derailment. And so right. that's the issue. And so uh, in those cases, it's often, as, as we know, management will make allowances for their jerkism yeah. uh, because, of, because they're afraid to lose whatever it is they're, they're contributing why not but also not really calculating the uh the outcome or how the jake the jerkism may be affecting the organization as a whole maybe it's not they look at it as a zero-sum game when it's not right that's right and it's a it's an important problem because the center of creative leadership did a study and said that 74 percent of leaders have had at successful leaders have had at least one intolerable boss so mm. you know ladies and gentlemen that means three out of four of us will have a difficult boss to deal with and I guess it's the part is, I mean, is, is sometimes though for people is differentiating between a, an exact, you know, a boss with exacting standards and somebody who is difficult. Yes, that's the quicker one identifies that the better one can protect oneself. So, and you know, we can all be abrasive mm -hmm. at times, but the sure. difference with a brilliant jerk is that their abrasiveness or they last over a longer time which really uh sort of rubs people and yeah 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 so they, they so people think oh it'll catch up on them eventually and when it doesn't seem to catch up on them it it, it causes even more issues yes Yes, that's right. And there can be a problem that lasts for years, you know, that no one addresses it. Uh, what happens if their boss is an avoidant leader and they mm -hmm. have an abrasive uh, executive under them? Well, right. they're not going to address the issue. They're maybe scared that if they do, they'll slam the door and go out or whatever. So it, you have to deal with the system. You have to deal with the people around them. So one of the first steps of my process is mm -hmm. to see the culture of the organization, uh, and I call it emerge. Uh, is it the emerging plat a place for brilliant jerks? Uh, so does the results are more important than uh, how it's done? Uh, right. Is the means justify the ends? And then culturally, what is valued? If you change somebody, you know, that is abrasive, but a lot of people in the company skyrocket yeah. the corporate ladder because their tough behavior, their cowboy behavior, well, mm -hmm. it's like putting a recovering alcoholic and bringing him to the bar with his drinking buddies. Right. So, so the first part of your process, your process, you're saying is to make sure that the it's it's an organization and cultural issue, right, to begin with, rather than the individual issue. It's both. Mm -hmm. It's both uh, because it's change is difficult to be sustainable at the individual level if at the organization there's not clear uh, clarification of what lead, good leadership is and and what is uncivil behavior and what are the consequences of uncivil behavior so it's of course it's uh, good leadership is sustainable in an environment that encourages it right right um okay so what's what's the next process so if you can get if it's not part of the process so if you can get somebody to you know, start to realize that they need to change how can you help them through that process and how do you actually get them even to to the point of self-awareness that change is necessary? Well, first of all, it's usually the, somebody else that calls me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I understand that because here they're brilliant, very smart, and uh, they're doing something right that the organization is keeping them. And maybe they're working extremely hard and they don't understand why the company is calling someone to work with them on their interpersonal. Maybe they're unaware of it, or maybe mm -hmm. they don't value 
relationships because they see it as being soft and not, you know, the tough executive that gets results. So uh, usually it's somebody else. It can be themselves, but usually it's somebody else. And then they offer them, you know, an executive coach to help them on these perceptions that is detrimental for his career or her career. Yeah. Well, we probably haven't helped um, things uh, by calling these things soft skills to begin with, right? Uh, because, I mean, it always seems to sort of uh, demote them in importance. And maybe to people like who are very driven or everything, the idea of a soft skill, this, as you said, maybe seems like, well, you know, that doesn't seem something that I really need to pay attention to. So once you get, once you get past that and you get somebody who, who maybe now has a mentor or somebody like you to coach them, what is the, what's the, what's the early part of this? Cause I always feel like the beginning must be quite difficult in, in particularly if somebody's not a hundred percent bought in yet. Yeah. So after emerge, the next step is educate and it's to offer and help the self-awareness of the person, uh, of the brilliant jerk, as I call them affectionately. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, so it's a self-awareness that they learn a lot about themselves. And uh, you also have to encourage their curiosity, how they're perceived both in the positive and the areas they can improve Uh, I don't force the issue. I offer research work uh, because, and then bring them back research, which is another step. But first, Mm -hmm. the first step is really to uh, see and give them insight on their reaction, their triggers, their values, the way they learn, the way they think. And as they're very bright, you can catch their attention, put it that way. And Another important issue is that to have the boss of this person uh, talk to them that say, this is an issue that you have to address. Because Mm -hmm. if they don't, they might think, oh, this is only a staff person. It's what do they know about business uh, and things like that. So you come in, you ask them, you know, why do you think I'm here? Do you think it's a possibility uh, that... uh, there's consequences on this type of behavior or these, what's, what stories are being taught or told about you that could be detrimental to your career. I can find that out. And, and it's interesting. One of the things I just wrote down here that you mentioned here is triggers. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't recognize and need help recognizing what, what triggers them. Cause we all have triggers. Um, but if you're not aware of them, you know, they can derail a lot of things. So how, how do you help people uncover their triggers and recognize that they are triggers? It's, uh, it's by good listening and then uh, really asking the questions. And I, again, I, I really underline the, the brightness of the person mm-hmm. because uh, if you get them the right questions, you have to create insight all the time. And going back in their past, and usually there's reasons why uh, they're abrasive. Mm-hmm. Do you want me to give you yeah. an example? Yes, please do, because I do, I do believe that. I do think, uh, as we say, people carry a lot of baggage, and their triggers tend to be, as you say, things that have, you know, they've brought with them or they or happened a long time ago or have happened con- or whatever things they bring with them, and, and they're on maybe unconscious that they're carrying them around on their shoulders. That's right. So there were two, uh, two men, two brothers, and uh, they were immigrants and uh, they made their children work very, very, very hard. But the eldest son was the star of the family Mm -hmm. and they put so much pressure on the star, hoping Mm -hmm. that this eldest son will pull them out of the social situation, the economic situation that they were in. So tremendous pressure on this first son. And then when the the son couldn't take it anymore and left the work at a farm, what happened to the younger son, do you think? Um, I don't know. The younger son was an average student, uh, basically was average 
anywhere. The, the eldest son had been good at school and all that. Well, when the eldest son left and decided to get out of the race, in a sense, the second son saw that there was a possibility to get the mm -hmm. recognition. There was uh, the shadow was no so longer saw, there. So the opening to step up and fill the fill the void. Absolutely. That's right. And so all of a sudden, the second son started to outperform, do very well, work a lot harder. Here he was an average student, and all of a sudden he was first in class. Mm -hmm. And so he enacted the, the desire of his parents, basically, and started to doing very, very well. But the results, it's like condition. Look, if you give the results, we'll love you very much. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you're not loved. So what do you think that's going to have? Of course, this is reductive explanation, but sure. you know, imagine that pressure. And so not performing means you're, if I can be reductive, you're not loved. Right, right, right. So face later in the corporate world with something that they haven't done or haven't succeeded, it's like terrible and uh, th they feel very threatened and they can attack. It's not everyone that is like that, but sure. can be for sure. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a fascinating, uh, a fascinating story because as you said, I mean, here's somebody who stepped up, who took the opportunity, got in there and achieved, but then when they get into the corporate world, they're always that one comment or whatever away from feeling like a, an unloved child again. That's right. Very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and therefore, obviously, anytime they see the possibility of that, they're going to do everything in their power and to make sure that that doesn't happen. And they're going to, and the, and they don't really care about the consequences of that because that's not what's important at that moment. And they compete. Mm -hmm. okay. A good, a, a, there's good competition and there's negative competition a zero sum game could be very negative and uh, it could starts very young i saw a mother that uh, the child was playing football and when the child didn't manage to do well was castigated mm -hmm. so uh, it's so yeah. i think it shows that parenthood is very important that you have to love your child for what they do but also for who they are and that brings yeah. a certain balance and I if mean, you think what you what you just outlined there though is very much the the, the the difference between the abundant mindset and the finite mindset because if you think about the the story you had there like the parents put everything on the first child to the and ignore the second child and then when the first child what they put on the and so when you carry that forward you're going to always see that there's only room for one person to succeed here as opposed to seeing you know it's an abundant world everybody can succeed and everybody plays different roles that's right that's very right. So let's say the second stage of I called educate is really getting the person to know themselves a lot better. Now, Daniel Goldman says that only 4% of leaders that have self-awareness can have social awareness. So it's unlikely if they, there's not a certain amount of self-awareness that they can develop first the control of themselves and also then have the leadership agility to react according to the situation and the person. And that's, that's the outcome that's desired. Be more strategic and also more empathetic. Yeah. And, and I think uh, the, the big challenge there is learning how to communicate with different people that, especially if you're in a leadership position, you can't, communicate just in a uniform way with everybody because people right. are individuals and receive information in different ways so being able and and it's obviously it it's obviously it's a it's a temptation to do to say okay this is how i communicate it's up to you to figure to adapt to me as opposed to me to adapt to you that's right and uh, for a long time that was successful for them so mm -hmm. it's an ingrained behavior and that behavior needs to be changed or at least have better perspective a more holistic point of view and understand people so this the third step is empathize 
and that mm-hmm. I call boss awareness. Why? Because the boss is probably has a lot of um, influence on the brilliant jerk's career. So right. they are probably very interested to get to know them better and see how they are. If that's not the case and they disrespect their boss, then find someone they really respect. It sort of makes it easier uh, and that they want the feedback. So I call it boss awareness. And then all the things that they've learned in educate and self-awareness is applied to somebody else and then develop the communication, what's the contrast, um, how they react, how they see things with compared to the boss. And so they already have to project and empathize and with the with the boss, or at least put themselves in the boss situation to analyze them at a very deeper level. And that uh, takes coaching because coaching will bring them to a deeper level. The first reaction is an assumption that they have, a quick thinking. And then it's really by this um, Socratic dialogue that you can bring them to think and feel more about the other person. And so that's the beginning process. And after that, it's not because they know how to adapt and communicate better and have more tolerance with their boss that they can develop the leadership agility to adapt to the person, different people Mm -hmm. in different situations. So there's two more steps. One is expand and that's stakeholder awareness where I do a lot of research from the company and his stakeholders or her stakeholders and bring that information back it's qualitative research it's inductive and 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 do people always realize like the level of the the range of stakeholders that exist well uh most people know about a 360 degree feedback system and i'll tell you why it doesn't work really in this situation Mm -hmm. a 360 feedback system is on a scale of certain competencies they get feedback from the boss of mm-hmm. the, uh, the coachee, the uh, peers of the coachee, and the employees of the coachee. And maybe c- clients or family members, it could be a series of people. And then what is um, evaluated by the bigger percentage of people on these competencies. So you can get answers like, oh, uh, he doesn't communicate well, or she uh, is abrasive, but that uh, in her interpersonal with her employees, that's information, but it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. We need to get a degree of detailed that they can have something actionable afterwards. And I I love to give one example that I have is like, uh, Mm -hmm after giving feedback on inductive means you don't have the competencies on a scale of one to five that they want to evaluate. You, you interview people and you have themes that come up, you know, communication. Okay. Let's say not good communication, which is usually often the case. So you, you interview people and you say, well, what does bad communication mean? What does it actually what does the person do and say? And this person said, well, she walks three steps ahead of me. And every time mm-hmm. I ask her a question, she rolls her eyes and sighs. And <sighs> yeah. so, so they're bright. They can get that degree of detail. And they are something that they're not even aware of. Yeah. So then they can... Uh, then the next step is also to make it actionable that uh, to execute. But before execute and changing and working on that change of behavior, I also work with, the, with them and their teams. And I call that empowering their teams. And that is not only uh, qualitative inductive research that you bring back to the boss, but also how they interact with their teams. And then you can get very valuable feedback to the, the coachee. And then that's empowering the team, what I call that process. And then finally, execute, which is 
a behavior plan that lasts between six and nine months is really developing the inside of the person and developing that leadership agility. Every situation or frustration is addressed and uh, bigger insights so that they can change sustainably and practice right. new behaviors. So to give, give, them, give them tools and ways of, of dealing with situations and embedding it and, and recognizing what they're doing. I think tools is maybe secondary. It's really mm -hmm. developing on what are their assumptions? What are their values? Well, how, how is it impeding them to get even better results? Right. Uh, and uh, I really use their intelligence to find solutions. So tools maybe, but it's really creating insights mm -hmm. about them in action. And then obviously from their point of view, being able to see the benefits of going down this path as they go. Throughout is what is their desire? What is their outcome? And how can they best get there? Uh, while not only thinking about themselves, but uh, having everyone succeed. Really, I mean, at a certain level of a company, if you only think about yourself, it's not going to work. Uh, right. It's really how can you make everyone around you succeed, and then you're a better leader, you have better results. So mm -hmm. it's thinking about how to engage others for your vision. And that comes to, after empowering the team, executing a behavior plan of better behavior for better results, then it's enlightening. It's really using all this information and insight to have your vision and empowering people and really motivating them to an alignment to this vision and using different ways of thinking, not just the leader's way of thinking, but how is your speech going to address all these different ways of learning, listening, and values. Yeah, no, this is, it's, it's fascinating because, I mean, I think we've all, as I said, we all probably know people like this, or maybe we are people like this, who knows? Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's fascinating. And I do think that uh, if there's one thing that's come out of the period that we're in right now, I think hopefully it's been a period of some self-reflection and maybe more people are open to going through the kind of process that you've outlined here than they may otherwise have been. Um, but it's, it's fascinating because it is at the end of the day, you're, you're in a position of, you're in a leadership position because there's something that you do really well. And if you could just get those other pieces in alignment, you could, you know, the world's your oyster, right? Yes. And I wrote a book called managing brilliant jerks. And in that book, there is, a message of hope that these people can improve their behavior and leverage their brightness. So I think they should be given the chance to do that. Mm -hmm. yes, otherwise, fantastic. it's displacing the, uh, excuse me, otherwise, it's displacing the problem, really. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Katrina, this has been fascinating. Katrina Vuras, uh, all of Katrina's information be in her contributor bio um, below here. Um, but before we go, Katrina, please do tell everybody a little bit more about yourself and MKB Coaching. So it's MKB Excellent Executive Coaching, and my podcast is Excellent Executive Coaching. On my website, there are articles of steps you can do to make sure that the company is clear on what leadership behavior is desired. I also have action steps and ways to stop abrasive and abrasive behavior in an organization. I am a Swiss and American citizen. I grew up in Europe and uh, I have two passports. And I uh, was in the banking industry and in a big corporation and I was well trained and formed in that bank. It's called Credit Suisse. But mm -hmm. uh, after five years, I decided that I wanted to do something to contribute and help others. And uh, I stopped, had two children, did my PhD and another master's. And then uh, just as I had two children and finished my PhD, I started this company. And I was the first master certified coach in Switzerland in 2002 of the International Coach Federation. And mm -hmm. I was, I'm very passionate of what, what I do. And 
of course, if I feel I can contribute and help somebody in their career, I feel gives my work significant. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thanks again, Katrina. My Thank name is John so Golden much. from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline, CRM. See you all again for another expert interview. Thank you so much.